Now that we've come to the end of learning block five, I thought it would be useful to review what we've learned so far. We started off by defining enterprise applications, which are large, complex, mission-critical software systems that are designed to operate in a corporate environment. So they're not small things. And the complexity comes from having many interrelated applications, each of which are not small. They've got lots of requirements. There will be concurrent access to very large amounts of data, often thousands of users with many types of client and, of course, security threats. All of this complexity means that designers have got a lot to consider. How do we store the data? How do we provide concurrent access? How do we establish the scalability of our applications so that when user numbers change, we're able to cope with that? And when business requirements change, how do we extend our application in such a way that we don't ruin the rest of the application? How do we provide the security features that are necessary these days? And what about our architecture? How do we get applications, many of which are non-homogenous, to interact with each other? Software frameworks can help with all of those considerations because they provide common functionality. They allow the developer to concentrate on the application-specific functionality instead of all of that common functionality that is used in all the applications. The frameworks also address the low-level complexities, for example, the data storage, scalability, extensibility, and security. So much of that is provided for us if we choose the right features of the framework. But on the slightly negative side, these frameworks can be difficult to learn. They can be very tricky to debug. And it can, if we're not careful, lead to vendor lock-in. We also learned about REST, which is a widely accepted software architectural style and is used to create stateless, reliable web APIs. RESTful web APIs are based on HTTP methods to access resources and enables the scalability, the simplicity, and the reliability that we're often looking for in our applications. When using REST, we'll often want to make use of JavaScript object notation, which is a data exchange format and is very commonly used to pass data between client and server. One of the nice things about JSON is that it is independent of programming language. So we can write a Java program using Java objects. And when we want to transfer data from those Java objects to another application, maybe written in C Sharp, we can construct a JSON string from the Java objects pass that over to the C Sharp application, which will then create a corresponding set of its own objects from that JSON string. In Spring Boot, we have the lovely advantage of the RESTful API automatically converting between the domain objects and JSON. And if we want to send an HTTP request with a JSON payload, we can do it like this. There's the request. It's very important that we tell the server that the content type of the payload is JSON. Don't forget the blank line. And then the payload, which is a JSON string. So with those components available, we're able to set up architectures like this. Here's our RESTful API that provides the application's functionality, and it will interact with the database. This RESTful API is then available to all the various types of client. Whatever form those clients might take, they can all interact with the RESTful API by sending HTTP requests. The RESTful API will process those requests, typically interacting with the database in some way. It might be that we get data out of the database and then send those objects back to the clients. But of course, that communication will often be in the form of a JSON string. Now, for this next little bit, I'm going to assume that we're talking about web applications as the client with our RESTful API on the server and then a database behind the RESTful API. So what about this RESTful API's architecture? Well, we've seen already that it will have at least one REST controller class. Those REST controllers expose endpoints for the web application and indeed other clients to call by sending an HTTP request. And these endpoints are providing access to the service layer. So the REST controller will then call methods in the service classes. The service classes provide the business logic. So the methods in here should not do very much work 
Typically, they will receive the request and then immediately delegate all the work over to the service class and then receive back from the service class a response, which it then passes back to the client. And the client will do the display of the data that comes in that response. The service classes, as part of doing their business function, will want to interact with the database and they'll do that by working via repository classes. And the repository class that we choose will determine just how much boilerplate code will be needed. On the web application side, there is a similar architecture. There are controller classes which expose endpoints and those endpoints are used by the HTML forms. Those endpoint methods will then access the RESTful API by sending an HTTP request for a RESTful API endpoint. This controller class, when it receives the response from the RESTful API, will then display other HTML views that contain the response data. These HTML forms and views are HTML files that are designated as templates, and we use the time leaf elements in our Spring Boot web applications to bind the HTML elements in those forms and views to properties and methods in backend classes. And to facilitate the transfer of objects between the various components of this architecture, we use data transfer objects. And these are POJOs, plain old Java objects, just standard Java classes that store the data to be transferred across the system. Now, from the user's point of view, they're just going to type some data, press a submit button and get a result. But of course, in the background, there's a lot more going on. When that submit button is clicked, the data in this HTML form is submitted to the web controller that then formulates an HTTP request, sends that request to the RESTful API. The RESTful API takes that data and processes it using service classes. The service classes will use repository classes to store or obtain data from the database. That database data is then formed into a data transfer object that is sent back to the web application. So this is now back in the web controller. The web controller will then activate the next view and display that data that's in the data transfer object in some appropriate way. We've looked at how to create database tables. One way is to do it manually. For example, we've used PHP MyAdmin to create tables in a MySQL database. And we could also do it using a higher level database migration tool. And we've used Flyway to do that. And what we've done is put SQL commands in migration files so that when we start the application, Spring Boot will run those migration files and it will create and populate data in the database ready for the RESTful API to make use of. And when we want to use the database, we've got four ways in which we can do that. All of them are repository classes. In our first attempt, we use just raw JDBC code to explicitly connect to the database, prepare statements, execute those statements, and process the results that come back typically as result set objects following a query. And that required a lot of boilerplate code. So the next approach we took was to use the JDBC template class. And that removes some of the boilerplate code. For example, we no longer have to connect explicitly. That's done by the JDBC template. But we still have to explicitly prepare the statements and execute them. And then instead of processing result set objects, we're processing row set objects. But again, there's a lot of boilerplate code. Essentially, the only boilerplate code that we've removed is the connection and indeed the closing of connections to the database. We then looked at using a CRUD repository where we provide the type of data to be used and the type of the ID in that data. The great thing about this is it removed most or all of the boilerplate code, leaving us only the responsibility of processing the domain objects. But it still left us with the responsibility of forming the relationships between the objects that came from the CRUD repository. 
And then most recently, we looked at the JPA repository and the type of the value is now an entity class, again, with an ID type. And because this uses the JPA, along with our entity classes, we have now removed all the boilerplate code. There is no longer any need to establish relationships between objects because the JPA does that for us. The only thing left for us to do is to process the domain entity objects. We've also looked at using Lombok annotations, which again significantly reduce boilerplate code. We've looked at the inversion of control, which means that instead of our own code through the main method controlling execution of everything, it is the framework that does the controlling. And we write components that plug into that framework. We've looked at dependency injection, and that we've seen that in Spring Boot, there's an inversion of control container that manages the creation, use, and deletion of the objects that it manages. And these are the type of objects that it manages. And we've also looked at UML diagrams, specifically the use case diagram, activity diagrams, the class diagram, and sequence diagrams. So what a lot we've already seen in just these five learning blocks. In subsequent learning blocks, we're going to look at a lot of other things that will help to make our applications even better.